All right, I get to do the most fun thing in the whole world for me, and that is teach God's Word. I love God's Word, and I always look for an opportunity. I don't do leadership over there because I'm teaching at 10 o'clock over here. I've invested my whole life in the study of God's Word. That's all I've ever done. And I'm a guy that, that didn't like books. I, I was a, not a, an A or B student in school. I was uh, a D student, all right? Because I just didn't like books. I didn't like to read. I didn't want anything to do with school. He, even though he didn't like books, the guy was a genius, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he says. <laughs> but he did. He says, you know what? I'll just take all your tests in one day. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. Oh, look, uh, <laughs> let's be modest about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one time um, the teacher made a deal with me, and the teacher said, look, if you pass the final exam, I will pass you for the whole year because I had Fs in the class. So, um, so I actually studied and um, I took the final exam and made an A on it. And she loves it. Listen, listen. She told me, there's no way you could have made it. You couldn't have learned the whole year in, in two days. And, uh, and so she brought a chair up right next to her desk and made me take another test, final exam, right beside her where she watched me the whole time. And I passed it with an A again. She called my dad. She says, your son is a genius. <laughs> so, uh, but the thing is, is, is I never liked books and school. And, and the thing is, when I gave my heart and my life to the Lord, one of the things that he changed in my desires, say desire, is, is that he gave me a desire for his word and put it in my heart to teach his word. And so here I am 30 something years later, teaching the word of God and I absolutely love it. So I want you to get excited about the word of God. All right, now here's what we've been talking about. <clears throat> Let me see if I can uh, review a little bit in my mind. I've been talking about the importance of the Bible, the word of God, say amen. We said that the word of God is light. Do y'all remember? Um, you remember the scripture? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. So how many of you um, at night like to turn a light on? All right. So, um, so the Bible says that it is the light you're turning on for your life. In other words, if you don't live by the word of God, the lights are not on. That's why the Bible said I was once lost, blind, and now I see. Because the Bible is light. Then we talked about the Word of God being bread. How many of you like to eat? That's all right. I, all right. Let me get on this side. All right. So we saw in the Old Testament where where. God fed the children of God, Israel, manna that fell from heaven. And how often did the bread fall? Every day. Every day. Then Jesus follows it up in the New Testament and he says, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. So the Bible is bread. And how many of you know if you don't eat, you start getting hungry, right? Ultimately, you start to starve because I had a good experience. I don't know if it was a good one, but I had an experience one time where I went a long time without eating. So I didn't even want to tell you about that story, but it involved bloodhounds and them chasing me with guns and, uh, in, in, in the woods. And I went a long time without eating. So I can attest that when you don't eat, come on now, you get hungry and then ultimately you start to starve to death. Literally, I was starving to death. So I started eating raw stuff like armadillos and frogs and all, anything else I could find. And don't tell me what you eat and what you, you won't eat. Don't tell me what you don't like because when you start eating to survive, listen, let me tell you something. When you're hungry and a snake uh, goes by you, he's in trouble. So, 
I'm done. Somebody said, oh, I don't think I'd ever eat snake. Don't tell me that because I'm telling you what, about, it'll take about four days. Four days and that snake, you know, he does smell kind of good too. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa says he chases like chicken. <laughs> I don't know. It didn't really taste that good. But the uh, thing is, is, is when you're eating to survive, you don't worry about what it tastes like. And if you don't think God's got a sense of humor, he put like 250 uh, cups of taste on your tongue so that you could go, mmm, when you eat M&Ms. So uh, <laughs> I didn't say they were good for you. I just said they tasted good. So we learned that the Bible is bread. And, and the Bible, Jesus teaches us, give us our daily bread. We said that we've got to have a word from God every day because God's word is food for us. And if we don't hear God's voice daily, then we haven't been fed and man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. All right. Then we talked about the word of God being water. Do y'all remember that spiritual rock that followed God's people around in the wilderness? Shout somebody. And, and so we talked about the word of God being water. And then we talked about Satan. The Bible says out of his mouth, he spewed a flood. And that flood was to chase the, the woman, which the woman represents the church of God. In other words, the devil's trying to bombard you on a daily basis with a flood of bad news, a pandemic, a, a terrible storm. You're not going to make it. You married the wrong woman. You, uh, uh, you married the wrong. <laughs> Let me get on this. This side's nicer. <laughs> But, <laughs> and the Bible said, <laughs> this section over here got the joy. That's all I know. <laughs> I will liken him unto a wise man who has built his house on a rock. And when the floods came and, and the rains came, great was the stance of that house. In other words, that house withstood but I will liken the man that doesn't hear my saying, said Jesus, as a foolish man that, that built his house on the sand. And when the floods came and the storm came, great was the fall of that house. Here's what we learn. The water of the word of God, Jesus, the rock, when we build our life on the rock, that water follows us. That spiritual drink follows us everywhere we go. Shout somebody. you got to drink of the water of God. If you don't drink of the water of God, the floods of, of negativity, the floods that the devil is spewing out of his mouth to persecute the woman, the church is chasing you. So you got to drink from God's fount and not from the devil's fount. Shout somebody. So the word of God is water. Now, today I want to talk about the word of God being dominion. The authority, the power of the word of God. Listen, years ago when I was uh, busted, broken, and disgusted, okay? Okay. When I got a hold of God's word, the authority and power, the dominion of God's word came into my life and it changed who I was. It changed my identity. It changed the way I talk. It changed the way I treat my wife. It changed the way that, uh, that I live my life. It changed everything about me. Here's what I want, three things I want you to get. 
The power of the dominion of God's word in your life, it brings peace, it brings purpose, and it brings power. Now say with me, so because that's what I want you to get. Because every time you speak, you got to say, all right, what do you want the people to know? And what do you want the people to feel? And what do you want the people to do? So that when they leave the place, they didn't just hear a bunch of words and walk out and didn't get anything. So here's what I want you to get out of this. The power of God's word, Christ, his kingdom, brings peace, say peace. It brings purpose, say purpose. And it brings power, say power. So say it with me, peace. Say it again. Say it again. All right, now we learn by repetition. So that's how I memorize scripture. I say it over and over again. Um, I'll never forget um, when I was in jail, I was on the chain gang. And um, in my pocket, I had the three by five index cards. And while I was walking with my hoe and my shovel, I was memorizing scripture. Come on now. Listen, let me tell you something. They had no idea that dominion and authority and power was coming from God's word on the inside of me that was changing my heart and changing my life and then empowering me. Listen, that I didn't get out that day, but by putting that word in me for years, all of a sudden came the day I stood in front of the uh, parole board when I didn't even come up for parole and they gave me parole and I walked out of the place. It, it was because of what God did in my heart. It was because I memorized God's word and I was applying God's authority and power to my life. And as a result, it transformed and changed everything about me and also uh, my world. How many of you know that the authority and power of God's word in your life will change your world. Come on now. It'll change atmospheres. You can walk into something negative and you've got the authority of God and the atmosphere changes. Listen, it crosses over from demonic, from darkness to the light and power of the living God. It's the keys to the kingdom. Shout! So let's jump into it. Y'all ready? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. What's the purpose of God for all of our lives? And God said, let us, Trinity, make man in our image after our likeness and let them have what? Dominion. I named my boat Dominion. By the way, my boat was on Grand Isle. I saw pictures of it still on the trailer right where I left it. Say what you want to say. It says dominion on it is still there. Hallelujah. Not a broken window. I, I don't even see a scratch on it. So um, it went through 150 mile an hour winds. Are y'all out there? So, uh, somebody's, oh, that's a coincidence. All right. Okay. I'm just going to keep walking. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over all the animals, the earth, everything that creepeth. Verse 27, got to be with me. So God created man in his, how many of you know that you're supposed to look just like God? Hey, did you know that God's purpose is for you to actually shine the light of his image to the whole world? that you are created by God to be a witness to the whole world. Really, there should be on planet Earth 8 billion light images of God. Imagine that. Because you were actually created in God's image after his likeness. So God is actually counting on us to look like him. I said represent on planet Earth. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. How many of you know we're equal in our creation? I I didn't say that um, you didn't have roles and responsibilities because obviously a male 
um, is uh, he has masculinity and a woman has femininity and there are difference in their roles in their creation, but they are created equal as far as creation. Shout somebody, man is not better than woman, woman is not better than man. We're all equal. Shout. All right, and I don't want to hear no male show. Oh, woman, you get over here. You get under my thumb. That, I, I, I'm not talking about that. Verse 28, and God did what? Hey, did you know you're blessed? And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave us dominion. God's original purpose for all of us is to walk in the power and authority of the living God. It's to be the image of God on planet earth. We're actually to rule over planet earth. God literally created earth, put man on earth for us to rule over it. Shout somebody. Listen, you were created to win. You were never created to lose. That's why I can't, I can't accept losing in life. I, I can't accept uh, not fighting the good fight. I can't accept backing up. I can't accept shutting up. I can't uh, accept not standing up. I can't accept it because you were created by God to rule. You are a ruler over planet Earth. You have authority. The power of God is upon your life. You are representing. You is a representative. And the power is not in you, it's in God. But it's from God to you, through you. And that's how it works. That's how it operates. All right, so then what in the heck happened then? What happened was, was Adam and Eve forfeited the dominion and the authority that God had given us to the, to the snake, the serpent, Satan, that entered into the human race by man not obeying God, but obeying Satan. And immediately when they sinned and disobeyed God and did what God said not to do, they transferred that dominion and that authority to Satan. Luke chapter four, verse six. Somebody said, well, you got to show that to me in the Bible. I will. And, and you remember the temptation. Uh, the account is in Matthew four and Luke four. You can read both accounts. I like Luke's account better because the last verse in those temptations with Jesus, the Bible actually says that when the devil got finished with his temptation and Jesus overcome every temptation that was uh, 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 tempting him, the Bible said that Satan left him for a season. That meant that there are times in our lives when there are more warfare than at other times. Because that's why I like Luke's account. So Jesus overcame all the temptation. Remember, if you're the son of, of God, command this rock to turn into bread. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Jesus overcame the, the attack of the devil by the power of the word of God. There's dominion in the word. There's power in the word of God. Shout somebody. There's light, there's food, there's water. It's all in the word of God. Everything you need is in the Bible. And so here's what the devil did with one of the temptations. And the devil said unto Jesus, all of this power, this dominion, will I give unto you and I'll give you the glory of them for that is delivered unto me. Leave it there because I got to talk about delivered. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now you can read this whole account. Jesus never ever argued with the devil saying, saying that, that, that you don't have this authority and that authority was given to uh, humans um, and you're out of place. He never said that. You know why? Because 
Man forfeited that dominion through their sin and obedience to darkness. Now, just think about it. Here's, here's a, 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 a spirit that is fired in heaven. He comes down to earth, and then you start obeying him. You working for a doggone man that's been fired. Just stop and think about that. This guy's kicked out of heaven. Then he took a third of the angel. Come on, John, need some help. I'll jump him. Oh, his future's not good, and then you want to obey him, and y'all want to hang out. Y'all want to go partying. Yeah, together. And talk about how much fun you're fun you're having. All right. But look what the devil said to Jesus. He said, For this dominion, this authority, this power that I have. It was delivered to me. In other words, I got it. And Jesus never refuted it. Not one time. He did not refute that the devil didn't have dominion. So now we got a problem. I'm trying to go from Genesis all the way to uh, Hebrews today. So now we got a problem. The problem is, is we've lost our dominion. We've lost our God inheritance, our God-given authority that God gave us from the garden. Because the original plan of God was, was that we would be in the image of God and the likeness of God and that we would rule over planet Earth. We just read that in Genesis 126 through 28. Now we see the devil flaunting his power and telling Jesus, if you'll just bow down before me and worship me, I'll give you all the power of this world because it's delivered unto me. It's mine and I give it to whoever wants to make a satanic covenant with me. Whoever will agree with me and obey me, I will give you the glory of the world. I will give you the authority of this world. How I many you know the devil's a liar? Don't think that you're going to uh, make a satanic covenant with the devil in some kind of way. Uh, you're going to benefit from it. Come on now, I'm telling you right now. The devil is a liar and the truth is not in him. So, all right, so now we got a problem. We've lost our dominion, but God's got a plan to get the dominion back for us. Are y'all out there? Um, And so that's where we're going to go. So how did we get it back? We got it back because Jesus came, shout somebody, and did what Adam didn't do because Jesus is the second Adam. He came and he obeyed God and took back the dominion and gave it back to us. Matthew chapter 28. Let's look at it. And Jesus came and spoke unto them saying, all power is given unto me in where? Heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. So here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have taken back what you lost. I've taken back the authority and the dominion, and now I'm empowering you. I'm endowing you with the authority and power. Hold my mule while I run around this doggone place. I got so excited when I read this 30-something years ago about my identity and about my inheritance and about the power of God, authority, dominion, keys to the kingdom. That I had authority to speak to mountains. I had authority to overcome hardship in this world. I had authority by God to be an an heir, an an inheritor of God and join heir with Christ. Man, I got excited. So, So Jesus Christ wins it back. Now, I wanna go through it step by step through the Bible to show you exactly what Jesus Christ did in his death, his burial, um, uh, his death, his crucifixion, his burial, and then how he went down into hell, shout somebody, and slapped the devil upside the head and grabbed the keys 
and then arose from the dead with the keys to the kingdom and said, now all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now I'm giving it to you, so you go therefore. I've restored what you have lost. Y'all ready? All right, so let's jump in it. So Jesus came and he lived a sinless life. How I many of you know the only power the devil had was sin? It's disobedience against God. So when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin came in, it empowered Satan. Satan is a, a, a rebellion. He's darkness. He rebelled against God in heaven and that's why his arrogance, pride came into him and then he rebelled against God, wanted to be like God and then he was kicked out of heaven to earth. So he comes to earth with, with the spirit of rebellion and then he comes and tips Adam and Eve to disobey God. Oh, has God said if you eat of that fruit that, 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 that you would die? You sure you would die? You sure that God is not holding something back? For, we, we, we can eat of all the trees, but this, just this one he said we couldn't eat of. Oh, God knows you won't die when you eat thereof. It does look kind of good. Let me see. And a boneheaded husband, Adam, right next to Eve. And she takes a bite and then hands it to him. And what does he do? He takes a bite too. He should have immediately jumped up and said, you lying serpent, what in the heck's wrong with you? We love God with all of our heart. We obey the Lord. We have his authority and his dominion. We refuse to disobey him. Woman, Get thee behind me. Get behind me. Let me protect you. He didn't do that. He should have. So I, I don't know. I wasn't there, but he shouldn't have. He should have stood up. And he didn't stand up. I'm telling all men, you got to stand up. And I'm talking about with the right spirit where you lay your life down for your wife and for your family and you're a good provider and you love them and you honor them. And you're molding them and shaping them and growing them and developing them while you're growing and developing. That's your role and your responsibility. So Jesus came, he lived a sinless life. Then he paid the price of death for our sins. Somebody said, well, why did he have to die? Like, especially the way that he died, crucified. The Bible says in Romans chapter three, verse 23, this is why Jesus had to die. The Bible said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that means that every one of us are sinners. Then the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, concerning the wage that has to be paid, the price that has to be paid for sin, for, for you to be justified, for you to be redeemed. It said, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody shout right there. Um, so Jesus had to come a sinless, sacrificial lamb, the lamb that takes away the sin of all the world. He had to come to pay our sin debt, which was death. So one way or another, death has to be paid for each one of us. If Jesus doesn't pay your sin debt, you got to pay it yourself. And we're talking about, we're not talking about non-existent. What we're talking about is, is spiritual death is separation from God. So the death we're talking about is, is that you would be at a barbecue under the earth and you would be the barbecued and God's presence would be separated from you, and that's death. Meaning that wherever God is not, that's death, okay? Because God is the only life giver, shout somebody, in the universe. So if you don't got God, you're separated from God, you dead. You holla. I never forget, I had um, a friend that told me and, and he had been in witchcraft and he actually sold his soul to rock and roll and demons came into him. 
and he was really oppressed by the devil. And this is what he told me. He said, brother Ricky, one day I went to hell. I said, brother, please give me a, an eyewitness account of what hell looks like, what it feels like, so I can understand hell. He said, it's nothing but total darkness. There's no hope. God is nowhere around. There's no life. And he said, all of a sudden, I looked up, and, and coming towards me was one of my friends, and he was in hell too. And he said, and some hope started coming up into my heart that, hey, there's somebody I know. There, there's somebody that I, I can be with and, and connect, and we have a relationship. And he says, and when I got to him and looked into his, the holes of the sockets of his eyes, he says, when I looked, there was nothing there. He was dead. The reason why they were dead in hell is because God was not there. There was no life. There was no light. God is light. So the Bible says this. It says that we've all sinned. It says that the payment for sin is death and Jesus is the gift that he gives us of life for that death. In other words, he pays the death debt for us. How I many of you know it's an exchange program? You give Jesus all your bad and he gives you all his good. Shout somebody. And then you access that. Somebody said, well, how do you access this life? Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead resurrection power we're going to talk about that uh, you shall live in other words uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved so here's what's got to happen you got to believe with your heart. You got to believe in your heart. And then you got to speak Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Your heart and your mouth are in agreement. Your heart and your mouth are married. And when that happens, you release the power of Jesus Christ to come into your life. You release the kingdom and the dominion, the authority of God to come into your life to save you. Shout somebody. That's how you get saved. I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting. I'm telling you now. I'm, keep it up, Brother Ricky. Good job. Keep, keep preaching, brother. So, number two, how did Jesus do this? I put one simple explanation. Resurrection. Jesus is crucified and buried, and on the third day, Mary goes to the grave. Let's pick it up. We're in John chapter 20. Y'all ready? Y'all want to see Jesus Christ um, from his death, crucifixion, buried, and now resurrected. When he resurrected, he resurrected with all authority and all power. He took the devil out. Shout somebody. John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day, say first day. That's important. The first day of the week came Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary had seven demons, y'all remember? Jesus casted them out. She came early in the morning when it was yet dark. So it wasn't daylight yet. She came unto the grave. The sepulcher is, is the grave. And sees the stone taken away from the grave. Aren't you glad that the Lord sent an angel to roll that stone away? Then she ran and she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John the beloved, and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the grave and we know not where they have laid him. Now we're gonna pick it up in verse 11. So immediately, John and Peter take off run into the grave. They look in, into the, uh, the carved out grave out of the side of the hill, um, which was Jesus's grave. 
and they see the stones rolled away and they see that Jesus is not there. And so after they saw he's not there, they, they went to think about it and they went on home. You know how men are, all right, all right, back home. Mary stayed there and the Bible says she stood outside the grave and she was weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the grave again. And she sees two angels in white city and the one at the head and the other at the foot, by the way, is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Come on now with the angels on each side and God being in the midst, shout somebody where the body of Jesus had been lain. And they said uh, unto her, the angels, woman, why are you crying? And she said unto them, because they have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have taken him. I don't know where he's laying. And when she had said this, she turned herself back and she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, didn't it? She walked with Jesus two and a half years she knew Jesus personally in some kind of way she doesn't recognize. How you know you got to have Jesus open your eyes before you can see? Jesus can be right here, and if he don't open your eyes, you'd think he's a gardener or something. And Jesus said unto her, woman, why do you weep? And, and, and who do you seek? And she's supposing him to be the gardener. Can you imagine? The gardener's dirty and you know I don't mean it like dirty I mean it's like dirt dirty all right it's, I mean like it, it's, it would be hard in my mind to think that you would get mixed up the gardener that's working out in the dirt with Jesus but she did she said unto him sir if you have uh, taken him away tell me where you've laid him and I'll go get him and Jesus said unto her Mary Mary, I'm trying to say it like she got it. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, but teacher or master, which is to say master. And Jesus said unto her, girl, don't touch me right now. Don't try to hold me. And I looked at the Greek, man, does that mean cling to his foot like a little kid, you know, that's got your leg? Or does it mean touch that some kind of way that would contaminate Jesus because what's happening now is is Jesus is resurrected from the dead he's come out of hell Abraham's bosom now hell has different compartments in it hell is like Angola there, there's camp J there's C and there's different levels of punishment if you go to camp J I hear in Angola that it's the worst and not even a toilet in there, or, you know, and um, that's for people that don't want to act right in prison. So how many, you know, when you get to prison, it's time to start acting right. So <laughs> I'm just trying to think about that for a second. Um, so, so hell has different compartments. God had allowed a compartment in hell that had air conditioning. It was called Abraham's bosom. Y'all remember the 16th chapter of Luke when the rich man died and Lazarus, the, uh, the poor man died and, and both of them went to their destination. The rich man went to hell, right? Lazarus, um, the, the poor beggar went to Abraham's bosom and immediately um, the rich man saw Lazarus that used to be his servant that ate the crumbs from his table across the big gulf. In other words, there were different departments. And he said, uh, Father Abraham, he recognized Abraham. Abraham, because the Old Testament saints had to go to a holding place. They couldn't go straight to heaven. Jesus had not yet shed his blood on the true tabernacle in heaven. That was, uh, that Moses' tabernacle was exact image, exact reproduction, a duplicate of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. In other words, all the animal sacrifices and all the, 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 the furniture that was in 
the, the, the holy place and the most holy place, all of that was designed exactly like the true tabernacle that is in heaven that Jesus would shed his blood on for the redemption of all mankind. So Jesus had not yet shed his blood on the true tabernacle. So the Old Testament saints could not go straight to heaven. They had to go to Abraham's bosom, a holding place in hell that was air conditioned. And that's where Abraham is then. They wasn't barbecuing. It was, it was air, I always call it air conditioned. They wasn't burning in flames. And immediately, I'm in uh, Luke 16, I'm gonna quote it. The, the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and he looked across the gulf and he saw uh, Lazarus, the rich man. And the first thing he wanted to do is, is, is put Lazarus to work for him. But how many of you know that this ain't no commanded Lazarus no more, babe? It's over with. You in the spiritual realm now, so you ain't got no control over Lazarus. You can't lord him over anymore. I'm just saying this, that if you are a, 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 a controller, there's going to come a time that you won't be able to control anymore. So just get your heart right now. And the rich man saw Abraham. He said, Father Abraham, I, I implore you, I, I ask you to send Lazarus over here that he would take a, a a drop of water and dip it on my tongue for I am burning in these flames. And Abraham said, remember now, son, your past life. Remember Lazarus had it hard and you lord it over him and he desired to eat the crumbs from your table, but you were so stingy that you would run him off and you wouldn't even give him any scraps that the dogs wanted. And, and you lived your lustrous life. You lived your luxurious life. And, and now because uh, Lazarus believed in God and loved God, now he's comforted it and now you are burning in those flames the rich man said well father abraham if you would send lazarus at least back to earth so that he could tell my my family about this place and abraham says your family has all the opportunity to be saved and know about the place they got to read the prophets. They got to read the Bible for themselves and they won't believe. They're so caught up in their own lifestyles and doing their own thing and away from God that even if one arose from the dead and came back to them, they still wouldn't repent. They still wouldn't give their life. Listen, can I tell you, there is a place called hell. There's a place that, that, that's People go that refuse to listen to God. They refuse to obey God. They refuse to serve God. And as a result, they end up in a place called hell. And the Bible says that you'll be able to remember your own family. You remember every opportunity that you ever had to give your life to Jesus Christ. You remember uh, everything that you did bad to other people. And then you'll be burning in flames looking for a drop of water on the tip of someone's finger. I'm telling you, this is a place you don't want to go. But Jesus goes down into Abraham's bosom. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that Christ uh, went down into the lower parts of the earth, Abraham's bosom. And then he led all those Old Testament saints out captive. And this is what he said when he came up. He says, look guys, as he's leading the saints, the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom all the way to heaven. He says, look guys, I gotta make a stop in Jerusalem because there's a woman there I gotta see, she's weeping. And then they said, they said, hey, Hey, uh, can we uh, can can we walk around Jerusalem while you're seeing Mary? Can we walk around Jerusalem? Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two says that 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 
the, the saints walked around Jerusalem and many people saw them shout somebody. And, and, and then the Bible says, Jesus says, Mary, don't touch me, man. I'm on a mission. I got to go to the father. And, and, and Mary didn't touch him. And Jesus, after he met with Mary and loved on her and consoled her, by the way, he wanted to give the other disciples a message. And everybody knows that if you want anything done right, you got to ask a woman. Well, because you know, at first he thought, well, if you want everybody to know something, tell a woman. But no. The phrase did good, brother. No, I wanted to phrase that right. Well, what about, what about when, when you got off on hell and stuff and you never said what the Greek was about touching him? Yeah, the Greek in, is both. It's clinging and touching because I looked it up in Strong's on concordance. So I don't know if she was, if the scriptures actually saying, don't touch me because you'll contaminate me before I shed my blood uh, on the true tabernacle in heaven or Mary, don't hold me because I got a mission and I got to, I got to go do what I got to go do. And I can't let you hold my leg and hold me back. So, um, I don't know what the, I don't know what it is because the Greek word is both of them when I looked it up. So, um, so anyway, I don't know if she wasn't supposed to touch him and contaminate him or she wasn't supposed to grab his leg and hold him. I don't know which one it was, but it don't really matter because Jesus met with Mary and then he fulfilled what his call was. And that is, is to be the lamb of God that he would shed his blood for the sin of all of us, for the whole world. And that's what he did. And then he led the Old Testament saints to heaven. And then the Bible says that um, Jesus actually comes back. So um, let's pick it up in 11. Um, let's see where we're at. Um, 17, next scripture. Give me the next scripture. Oh, wait, wait, uh, put it back on 17. And Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my God, my father, and your father. Shout somebody. This is what Jesus has done. And to my God and to your God. That's, and by the way, you are a year today. Hallelujah. It's your is you. Mary Magdalene came and she told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, now remember this is the first day of the week. Jesus has just resurrected from the dead. The first person he comes to meet is Mary Magdalene, right? All right. He tells Mary, look, go tell the rest of my disciples that, that I've risen from the dead. Now the disciples have all come together in a place and in the evening time, the same day. In other words, Jesus went all the way to the third heaven, shed his blood on the true tabernacle. You read it in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Then he came back that evening to see his disciples and that's where we pick it up. And being the first day of the week, that evening, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled because they were fearing of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, here's the first word, peace. What did Jesus come to bring us? Peace be unto you. How many of you know the Lord brings peace in your life? And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Keep reading. And then Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you as my father, his purpose, as my father has sent me, so also do I send you. The dominion that I've won back for you, now I'm giving it back to you and I'm sending you. As the father sent me, said Jesus, now I'm sending you. Somebody better shout. So the, the three words that we're learning today, Jesus came, Jesus came to bring us peace. Jesus came to bring us purpose. 
And now he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Come on. Jesus breathed on them and I believe that Jesus got good breath and he breathed on them and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Shout somebody, stand to your feet. I think I've said enough. I could go on, but I think I've said enough. Jesus. Jesus. And look, I got all the scripture reference for everything that I've said. It's on the board here. And you can go back. Um, I tell you what I'd like to do. Put Hebrews 9, 12, and 24 up because I want you to see this. Got to read the, the chapter of Hebrews chapter 9. Um, look what the Bible says. That Jesus in heaven brought his blood. He says... He came neither by the blood of goats or calves like the Old Testament, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for all of us. Listen, he has actually purchased eternal life, eternal redemption. You're redeemed, man. Look at verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, not like Moses' tabernacle, which are a figure of the truth. That's why God told Moses, he says, every bit of furniture, every measurement of this tabernacle has got to be exact because the Old Testament tabernacle has got to be a reproduction of the, the true tabernacle that's in heaven, that Jesus ultimately will shed his blood for the redemption of mankind for eternity. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands. No, this is God's tabernacle, he made it. Which are the figures of the true, but Jesus has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for all of us. <laughs> Jesus. So that's how Jesus did it. Are y'all with me? How many of y'all like the Bible like I do, man? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this great church and thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is dominion, it's authority, God. That's our inheritance. We are people of promise. We are people of purpose, Father God. Lord, you came to bring us peace. You came to bring us purpose. You, as the Father had sent you, so now you've sent us, Lord. So Father, we thank you that we're, we, are, we have power. So we have peace, we have purpose, we have power in you. We have redemption, Lord. Now, Lord, bless your people as they go home. I pray your hedge of authority to camp around every household that's represented in this place, online, all of our people. I release the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to camp around all of us. I thank you, Lord, that you're causing us to recover from COVID, you're causing us to recover recover from the storm your favor your blessing is upon us now we bless your people in the name of Jesus say Lord forgive me save me heal me deliver me in the name of Jesus hey if you believe that say amen all right let's go let's go home